going over is different technological measurement devices. Uh, so we're basically outlining really our uh, basic motivation for measuring uh, electrical activity in the brain. Uh, we'll also go over the standards of the EEG, and we'll look more into our uh, different devices. Uh, finally, we'll end with some comparison to the conclusion of our practices. Okay, so there's uh, many medical applications and uses for um, imaging of the body, but um, today we're going to be focusing on brain imaging. Um, so first of all, um, Imaging of the brain can allow us to help or helps allow us to identify or observe what part of the brain becomes activated when you're doing um, certain activities or events, such as perhaps what um, what part of the brain is functions in controlling your motor nerves or your um, limbs or whatever, and what um, parts of the brain may function in neural activities, such as when you're trying to remember something. Um, another. Um, the application is it can help detect diseases um, within the brain or any abnormalities of the, the brain, such as if there's a clot in the brain, which can um, lead to any um, which can lead to blood um, clots in the brain and blood building up in the brain. Um, it can also help determine um, how effective a drug is um, and its behavior within the brain. It can help see if the drug is um, diffusing too quickly out of the brain or if it's even reaching its target cells. And if it reaches the target cells, is it does it ultimately um, do anything? Does it have an effect to help prevent any diseases? Um, it can also be used to help um, track the progress of a disease, such as um, the uh, movement of cancer cells. Um, overall, these all these images uh, come together to help provide a overall mapping of the brain. And there's many methods which um, can be used to image the brain. Um, each one has their own strong points depending on what you're trying to accomplish, but today we're going to be um, focusing on the fMRI and the MEG. Um, so first we're going to talk about the gold standard of um, detecting what's considered the gold standard when it comes to detecting brain um, activity. Um, the, most, or the most direct way of detecting um, signals in the brain is um, the EEG or electroencephalography. Um, and what it does is they place about um, 20. Yeah, they place about 20 or so electrodes on the on your scalp or on your um, head. Um, this can be done with a cap or it can be done with um, a certain gel paste, and it detects just changes in voltages um, along the brain, along your skull. And when you're hooked up to the EEG, there's the doctor, whoever's carrying out the um, the, the test, they try to instigate certain parts of the brain um, to become active so, um, and they have different events such as maybe flashing a light or telling you to lift an arm or lift a weight um, and this helps them see what parts of the brain um, are what parts of the brain have changes in voltages and this can help them determine if there's any abnormalities within um, these changes in voltage along the brain which ultimately tells them or ultimately assesses um, a patient's condition. Uh, one of the main problems with the EEG is that it has a very poor spatial resolution, and this can be seen actually with um, the signal is most sensitive to only a certain portion of the postsynaptic um, potentials located at a certain portion of the cortex. Also, the deep of the structures and certain of the holes that go through that fire tangential to the skull are don't really contribute to overall EEG, and um, the cerebral fluid and skull near the EEG, so it's something um, it causes smudges when you're taking. Okay, so uh, one of the devices that we're going to take, we're taking a look at is the functional magnetic resonance imaging, or fMRI. And what the fMRI is, is, is that it's a type of a special MRI scan used to uh, measure changes in the blood flow uh, related to neural activity. So uh, a little bit of background. Uh, uh, one of the things it uh, usually records is the, uh, the bolt signal or the blood oxygen level dependence. And what the bolt uh, signal is is that, well, changes in blood flow and blood ox oxygenation in the brain is closely uh, li uh, linked to neural activity. Uh, the larger the neural activity in the brain, uh, the more glucose and oxygen that needs to be delivered to the brain by uh, by the blood vessels. Uh, and within the hemoglobin, uh, the hemoglobin is uh, diamagnetic with oxygenated and paramagnetic. Uh, when deoxygenated, and the higher the voltage signal is, uh, it means that the, the 
there is an increase in the concentration of oxygenated uh, chemical. So basically what the fMRI does is that it uh, applies a couple of plant molecules to the body, re redirecting the axis of the uh, same protons. And uh, what the fMRI does is, me is it measures the, the uh, change in the spin of the protons and for how long it uh, lasts. Uh, these signals are uh, passed to the computer, which processes and generates uh, different images. Now, with the fMRI, uh, what the technician does is that it asks the patient to do uh, particular tasks, such as uh, closing your eyes, sleeping, uh, blinking, that sort of stuff, and um, which causes uh, increased metabolic activity uh, in the area of the brain, which is responsible for act that activity. Uh, this activity, which includes uh, expanding blood, blood vessels, uh, chemical changes, and uh, delivery of oxygen uh, can be recorded within these entities. So as you can see here, uh, the, the stronger bullet signal is related to the, the more bright colors, meaning that, uh, that there's more activity in that part of the brain during, uh, when the patient is asked to do something like sleep or, or that sort of stuff. So like all devices, there's uh, advantages and disadvantages to the MRI. Um, first of all, the advantages, it's, the major advantage is that it's non-invasive. You don't really, you don't have to inject anything to take an image, or it's minimally invasive. Um, if you do want to help um, get a greater contrast of something you're trying to track, you can inject a, a contrast agent. Um, another major advantage of this is that the fMRI can it can take images on any axes, and this um, allows it to produce a 3D image. Um, and this can be um, further, or this can be, um, I guess, exported to a computer for analysis. Um, it has very high spatial resolution. Um, about two to three milli millimeters is the average, um, but it can be as um, it can be as small as one millimeter with the best um, equipment. Um, and it can also um, detect signals throughout the brain, not just on the, the or the, the surface of the brain, which such as the uh, EEG. Um, there's some disadvantages. The, the common disadvantage is that, or the main disadvantage is that the patient uh, may be discomfort or may um, exhibit a lot of discomfort during the um, imaging process. That this, they may have to stay, um, or they have to stay still during the process because um, any movements can um, cause, uh, I guess, noise within the uh, image, and they can take as long from an imaging um, period can take as long or it can range from 20 to like 90 minutes, so they have to stay still that whole time, which can be uh, very uncomfortable. Um, another downside is that the image, um, if you're, they put it as, as morbidly obese. If you're like too big for the machine and you can't fit in it, that's another problem. Um, um, the, ex the machine is also very expensive and training is also expensive. Um, imaging um, can be, it can cost you around 300, to like thousands of dollars depending on where you are and what you're um, imaging. And another problem with the fMRI, um, with this method is that the bold response is an indirect method of um, determining if neuroactivity, um, it measures blood flow. And blood flow can be influenced by other factors of um, the body, not just um, neuroactivity. So this may cause, um, a, or this may cause um, one to mislead um, the analysis of the, image, I guess, and there's poor temporal resolution because um, you can't detect changes in neural activity or the bold signal um, within small periods of time because it takes about five seconds for the, um, the image to be produced after it detects, after the signal detects the, um, or the, after the device detects the signal. <coughs> so as Patrick mentioned that um, an fMRI takes a pretty long time for the patient to feel comfortable staying still for a long period of time. And that causes the patient to feel a bit anxious, who starts moving around, causes errors when taking the data. And it also causes the patient to feel fatigued or even fall asleep. So one of the ways to actually um, improve an fMRI would be to be able to correct um, motion, uh, motion errors in real time, and also to be able to decrease the duration of fMRI. So that way it takes a short time, the patient feel comfort feels comfortable, and there's not a lot of error within the data. So I'm gonna talk about the magnetic Magnetoencephalography, or MEC for short. In theory, it measures the groups of post-synaptic post synaptic uh, currents, cortical surface, neurons firing uh, synaptically. Basically, it just um, measures 
uh, magnetic waves coming from neurons. Um, intracell, um, the current intracell um, currents that are going through each of the cellular pathways. Um, uh, practically, it just provides a map of where these um, where these magnetics magnetic uh, um, waves come from. So, um, as you can see, there's a little kid here. He's watching Shrek too. Um, what we can see here is um, that uh, most likely his eyes will be the ones that will um, where it is um, where on the map it will show that it's being activated. And as you can see on the picture on the right, this is just the cortical surface of the brain, um, which is corresponds to a specific body part. Um, the, how big the um, how big the surface um, determines how much uh, fine control you need for that certain body part. Um, such as the hands and the mouth, or I mean the face, they'll have a lot of uh, surface area for those um, for uh, fine tuning uh, those um, those controls. So um, it's composed of uh, uh, basically two things. Dewar is just the fancy name for the element that it uses. Um, Dewar is composed of uh, squid technology, which is short for superconducting quantum uh, quantum uh, something device. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, what it does is each point of those things um, converts a magnetic um, magnetic magnetic wave into a voltage, and that just shows up on the computer screen. Um, it's super cool, so that the the superconducting qual um, qualities of those of that technology can be um, can be maximized. Um, it also uses a shielded room because basically, um, when uh, the mag magnetic waves of your of your brain is basically is very very small, it's on the femto Tesla um, like it's very 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 small. So things like passing cars, passing trains, other human beings, elevators. Those can um, contribute to the noise <laughs> in your measurements. Um, there's two rooms that they use: a magnetically shielded room. It's basically just a um, just layers upon layers of aluminum and um, iron, which basically um, absorbs the magnetic waves. And the active shielding system. Um, it's also um, walls, but then also uh, it also gives a positive feedback by canceling out those magnetic waves that are coming in. So um, post recording analysis, um, on your right, it just shows um, what happens. Um, it's just a measurement of, of when a person is doing a certain function. Um, I see eyes closed, eyes open, or looking at a computer. And from there, they can use um, some neural uh, techniques to find out where it is on the um, on the brain, and it just and shows where in real time to what intensity um, this uh, these magnetic uh, um, measurements go. So the advantages for the MEG is um, you can measure brain function. It also has a high temporal and spatial resolution. It's also you're, it's adaptable to mapping different um, functions, so memory, cortex, language, um, movement. It's also not invasive and easy to use, but there, the major disadvantages of the MEG is that um, due to the supercooling system that uses helium, it makes it really expensive and also makes the, the system itself pretty complex. Um, also due to the magnetic shielding that you need due to the, the small magnetic field that we have in the brain, so that shielding also makes it more expensive and um, less convenient. It also doesn't provide um, structural or anatomical information, so you need on top of MEG, you need another imaging system to map out the, the anatomical portion we're looking at. So to be able to improve the MEG, what would be a most ideal actually be to um, amplify the magnetic field of the brain, so that way you decrease the amount of shielding you need, so it'd be more cost effective, and also it facilitate the detection of uh, electrical signals. So if we were to compare uh, these devices to the, to the EEG, 